So, hello, Alex. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. So good to see you. Um, by the way, um, just for everybody to know here, you know, Alex, you you're a veteran in the in the ad tech space. Um, so I'm very excited because I think you have a lot to share as far as tech industry is concerned. Um, and to be honest, when I first got to know about you, I knew that you know we had this common workspace addictive. Yeah. Um, but then when I learned and researched more. I realized that I knew a teeny tiny aspect of, of who you are actually. So I'm very, very, very excited to speak to you today. First reason why I wanted to bring you here on this podcast um, is because I would like, I know that you were, you started in 2008 as an entrepreneur while you were studying. I, it was a side hustle that I had. So I was doing websites for companies uh, when I was a student. So I was in 2008, I was 18, uh, 17 and 18. Uh, so I, I only started websites. Uh, I think our, our first real company was 2012. 2012. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I read that about you, that you started your company as it was a side hustle, as you mentioned. But I did see that you you managed to scale it to eight, eight, how much was that? 60, 80K? Some, somewhere around the lines? Uh, the websites, I can't remember. It was probably north of that, but I don't know if I if I kept my LinkedIn up to date. But it was probably, yeah, it was probably north of that uh, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, it wasn't any sort of SaaS. It was really, you know, build a website uh, and charge for it, charge for maintenance, uh, which mm -hmm. was great. And and then repeat, rinse and repeat, ask for referrals and kind of a, that was a good good initiation to sales in general. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, the second reason, as I was going to say, mostly I feel like us humans, the ones that have not ventured in, in, in the on entrepreneurship space, we think of everything as singular. You know, what was that singular moment when this idea came to you? I want you to talk about your experience because I know that you've evolved. You've been in the ad tech space and today you're doing something really cool with AI creators um, in, in the UG space. So let's let's go back to to where when you started and what motivated you to to start with it while you were studying it's a great question so i i started actually even earlier i uh, i never shared this publicly but until mon until a few days ago but i have worked on a private beach in south of france when i was 14 and 15 years old in France, it's illegal to work until you're 16 and that's why i, I didn't necessarily share it publicly now i think i'm off the hook it's been long enough. And, um, and so that gave me a lot of confidence into uh, talking to people, uh, having a job was exciting, M making money was exciting. I was paying, a, I was paid a lot uh, for, for my age and actually paid a lot period. And uh, so that, that gave me a initial point, initial starting point. And after that, I just started to see, okay, I actually know how to do websites. It would be cool to use the fact that I I've been very used to talking to people and customers. Let's try to sell them websites and see if it's just the website. I, I did one website for my dad for free. And, uh, and and I liked it. I was like, let's see if I can do this for other people. And kind of started very organically where people asked, asked me for um, a website and kind of th that was a good like student student hustle and paid for, paid for a few things. Uh, and, and it's only after that I met, I was really, really lucky enough to meet uh, two amazing uh, founders in, in my school, in my university, and then they elevated me to a, to a new level. And that's when we started a real company together. Interesting. And going back to this, um, was that an agency when you were helping with websites or was, was that like a site also? Well, there were people part time that were helping me here and there that I was paying. I don't necessarily want to classify it as an agency or as side hustle in the sense that it's very hard to define what that was. It was basically me, my computer and some part time consultants. And we were building a website every now and then for yeah. a client that wanted a website. So call it an agency or call it a side hustle. It's like the, the truth is somewhere in between. Yeah. Uh, but it, it wasn't a full-time occupation for sure. I was studying in, in the software engineering school, so it was more so a side hustle by that definition. But I was operating as a as an agency where we actually did a lot of the work that an agency would do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, somewhere in between. And why why did you choose specifically e-commerce and event websites back then? Just trying to understand, you know, what were you thinking back then? 
Oh, I wasn't that picky. Uh, it was whoever wanted to work with me, I would take. And uh, uh, e-commerce, e actually, there was uh, it was an introduction from a friend to a, uh, to a C-level executive who needed the website redone for a small company. Um, and it kind of, you know, once you do one, it's easier to get another because you have the experience and you can showcase like this is what we did for this person. So kind yeah. of uh, started on, on a random note and then I, I honed in on the initial successes we had. I see. Okay. And then you, you also had a couple of side projects and I was seeing that you know, I actually tried to look for it. Uh, Uber stats. Oh, it's yeah. cool. um, but I wanted to ask, like, I saw that you, you got a lot of traction there. How, how did that happen? Was that, did you try some, some marketing you make or how did you spread the word around this project of yours? Yeah. So for context, Uber stats was a project where you uh, log into your Uber account and it would tell you how much you've spent in your lifetime on Uber uh, and in every currency and so on, but really like the total amount. And uh, it was a side project over a weekend. It was very fun to work on. And I did this to myself initially, like for myself, uh, because I had a debate with a friend because apparently I was taking Uber too often. Okay. And there was no way at the time to figure out how much you spend in Uber. So, so that's why it started. it started as a joke. Um, or as a bet rather with my friends that like, no, no, I'm not a big spender on Uber. And they were saying, yes, I did this for myself. And I realized, wow, like I spent so much more than I thought. And, um, what, and so I polished over the weekend, I polished the project and I put it on product hunt, uh, as a, um, uh, as the only source of like marketing, uh, mm -hmm. for, for the product. However, one sort of a funny trick that got me most of the traffic is that uh, we were missing a, a viral loop. So how do we get, or a K factor, like how do we get users to refer other users to the product? And uh, I decided to tap into people's ego. And we, I say we, it was only one person. So I was, uh, um, I had a, a leaderboard. Right. And so when you had your account, when you logged in and you, you could see how much you spent, mm -hmm. um, we could rank you based on all of the other users as to like, are you the number one spender on Uber? Are you number three? Are you number 167,000? And then we made it uh, an image that was generated from those leaderboards to show where you are in the ranking. And then people posted that to Twitter uh, and, uh, and other social media channels. And so like, look, I'm the number like 127th spender worldwide on Uber. Uh, and that got a lot of activity. So I can't remember the data. I think it's on my LinkedIn, but it's, uh, believe we hit a million users pretty fast or, or maybe a few hundred thousand users. I can't remember, but it was, it was significant for the short amount of time that, uh, that had, and then some press picked it up. So we had, um, I think business insider wrote an article about it and then other Whoa. press articles wrote an article about it. And so that drove additional, you know, additional, um, traffic That's and all pretty of that cool. led to traffic uh, after that. That's pretty cool. I mean, you tapped into the UGC thing back then. Yeah, it turns out. Yeah, <laughs> That's a good point. I really wanted to bring this up because, you know, from the from based on my research about about your rent, different ventures, it seems like virality, network effect. These are some some of some of the things that you've really tried to 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 leverage. And it's 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 interesting to see that you also try practicing it on your side projects. Yeah, I didn't necessarily it wasn't something I had designed from the get go. Initially, mm. it was just like, Hey, let's get people to see how much they spent. But really every step, as soon as you get a user, like, I feel like the first question you naturally tend to ask yourself, at least I do is how do I get the next 10 ones? And, and so I don't think from that as a virality perspective necessarily, but just, okay, how do we add more buckets of users for every user we onboard? And, um, and, and something very similar happened with, uh, a side project I had, done for Gary V. Um, so he's an entrepreneur from New York and he, I built a search engine for him. He, he didn't know I say for him, I built a search engine for me, um, to search through his videos, what he said. And so you could type, for example, in my search engine, you could type like Instagram and mm -hmm. then it would look through all of the videos that he produced. And every time he said Instagram, we would show you a link with that video and the moment in the video where he said Instagram. And so if you're trying to remember like, oh, I know Gary talked about X, Y, and Z, but I, he does a million videos. I don't know where he talked about this in our search engine. You can find this information in, in 
a few seconds. Um, and, and here the viral hack was just emailing Gary. I didn't know him at the time, but emailing Gary and be like, Gary, I built this awesome search engine for you. I hope you like it. And then instantly he put it on his website. He connected me with his teams. He put it on his website. He talked about it on YouTube and so on. And so again, we hit like, um, I believe it was 1.5 million at peak users, which again, you think about it from a virality perspective, I think from just like, how do we get buckets of users on, on, on the product? And there was no viral loop. The viral mm -hmm. loop was just, let's tap into an existing community. Yeah, I, I totally see that. Like tap into the existing co uh, community and, and see, you know, how you can scale it from there. So it's, there's some exactly. niche tapping in there, right? hundred percent. Okay. Uh, and then when did motion lead come into the picture? I believe after that. Correct. So it was, uh, it was before the Gary project. I can't remember if I did the Uber project after or before, but it, it came in, we, we started in 2013 and, um, we, it was, I believe it was April of 2013. And then we incorporated in September of 2013. And then four months after that, we went through YC in January of 2014 in the winter 14 batch. Uh, and that's when motion lead really in September, when we incorporated, we had a first client day one, a big client, and that kind of, uh, kickstarted the activity for motion lead. Yeah. Um, and then it was acquired by, I believe additive and, uh, you moved to the U S and that's something that I really wanted to talk about because you moving to the U S did you have exposure, um, before you moved for business purposes? What's, what's your background about that? Yeah. So I, turns out I was born in Boston. Okay. Uh, but I never lived in the US until the time where I moved for Motion Lead initially. So I moved from Motion Lead to San Francisco. And then for the acquisition of Addictive, flew back to Paris, lived in Paris for eight months, where I studied as well in Paris, prior to that. And so I, I moved back to Paris for eight months and then moved back to the US. Uh, so eight months later, the, the acquisition to open up the Addictive US office with, uh, at the time, my co-founder, Louis. And um, so we, we moved to New York uh, after the acquisition. But prior to that, I have never lived in the US, but I did come to summer camp uh, in the US with the ambition. My grandparents were living in the US and the ambition was, I was growing up in France. French are not the most English savvy people and uh, I think my parents knew that. And so they wanted me to learn English at the source. And so they sent me every summer uh, at a summer camp, like YMCA summer camp to learn English and, and have fun there. Ah, okay. Okay. So good exposure for you there. Yeah, it, uh, was, it was great. <laughs> yeah. I, the, why I was asking this is because, you know, many companies want, want to get into the U S market. And so I wanted to know for you how hard it was as a startup, especially, I don't know how well it was known by the US market, you know, because I guess it's harder. What is your take on that? Yeah, we think it's a mix of being very lucky and prepping correctly. So there's a few things that we, we did the first with Xavier and Emilien, so the, the founders of Addictive. The, the first is, and with Louis also who, who worked on this, um, on this launch, uh, the first thing we did was we wanted to work with customers from the U.S. from France. I mean, the customers were from the U.S. and we were based in France. And right. the idea was like, let's launch the U.S. activity with a few customers. Let's not make a big splash. Let's not hire a team. Let's just try to get a few customers from the U.S. to validate there's demand for our product in this market. So we worked by night, a lot of the times by night uh, from France to work with U.S. customers. And sometimes I remember very vividly, uh, Louis and myself were in the office in the addictive office in, uh, an opera at the time. And, uh, oh, that one. yeah, the, the, the good old favorite office. <laughs> and so we, we were stopping work by night when people started showing up in the office in the morning and this was our cue. Oh, we might need to sleep. So let's go to sleep at 9 AM and then we'll wake up later. Uh, so like we, we had these like quite often, the, the like work by night. It allows to secure a few customers. Mm -hmm. It allows to secure revenue and establish that there's demand in the US. And only then we moved to uh, New York because we already had customers. We already had revenue. We knew we had demand. We had already tested the, the, you know, the messaging and so on and the value prop. 
which is very expensive to do if you're testing from the US because it might take one iteration to get right. It might take 27 iterations to get right. Right. But because we did it in France and we, we traveled every now and then, like I just flew to the US uh, to meet with customers on my LinkedIn, I had put that I live in San Francisco. And so people were talking to me like I live in, in San Francisco. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so like these, these things helped. And then we had to do an expedited um, immersion. So uh, to this day, I tell the story often where I had in my um, bathroom and bedroom, I had printed pictures of people that I wanted to work with, like our prospects. Okay. Because at events, like if I was going to an event at a mobile app tech event, I knew no one there. Mm. And if you don't know anyone and there's a thousand people in a room, you can't talk to a thousand people. And so it's very hard to figure out who you want to really talk to. Uh, and so I had photos and company name. And so I knew if I were to see that person at an event, I knew that that's a person I would want to talk to because they're in my like photo board. Uh, so that's kind of, a. Uh, this is pretty interesting. How, how many pictures did you have in the bathroom? Oh, not a 300, like a lot. <laughs> Whoa. But I think um, it looked like a serial killer apartment at some point. Uh -huh, I think I believe you know remembering the names of people makes makes a great impact. You know if they see you, and and you can recollect the name. I think that's that's a great thing to do. It was a great hack for us, uh, certainly, and we, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily remember all three hundred, but I knew, I knew a good amount of them, and I knew that if I saw a face. Even if I can't put a name to it, I knew that that face was relevant for what we were doing, and so that that helped a lot to get the first to get the first competition going. Because one very simple example that I can share is that um, met with a woman f from the photos, so I recognized her. I knew what vertical she was in, so she was a social gambling uh, app. And when she talked to me, she's like, "Oh, who do you work with?" And, and I could have said, "Oh, we work with non-gaming, gaming, lifestyle, whatever." Um, what I said was, oh, we focus on social gambling. Mm. And so instantly it was a click for her. It's like, oh, interesting. If you do this, like, I'm probably interested in what you're going to say next. Uh, so, so it's like those things, right? So I, I didn't necessarily need to remember the name. Um, more so what vertical, what company they're in. So I can adapt the pitch without asking them, where do you work at? Oh, you work. Oh, you know what? It happens that we're also specializing on a vertical. This is so interesting. You know, I've, I've never heard of an advice like this, but I think this, this is people's management in a way, you know, you being able to know how to manage people. And I, that's, a, that's a crucial aspect of running a business, something that we often it overlook, helps. I believe. <laughs> yeah. Helps. I know that you have this image of a, being a very hardworking person, like all the people that we know <laughs> commonly, uh, I want to know from you, um, if you were to start your own venture, what does it take to get there to a level at which you want, you know, hard work, smart work, people often talk about it. And I've seen you openly talking about hard work in a positive way. So, yeah, it's a very hard question because the, it's a great question, but it's a very hard question because the, I don't know that anyone has a playbook for what you need to do, um, to, to build a successful company. And I would argue, you know, if you look at the best incubator in the world, so Y Combinator, they still have no idea how to build a playbook. They've optimized to increase the chances of success, but they're still very far from a hundred percent success rate. So if they, and they have the most data, the biggest data set in the world. So if they haven't figured it out, then, and then you look at founders that are, that have built billion dollar businesses in the past and they launch a new venture and it often, often time doesn't work. So it's very hard to say like what, what it takes. What I think about at least, and so this is not necessarily advice, but more so what I tell myself is there are a certain number of cycles you can go through as a company until you run, you run out of cash. So mm -hmm. I think of those as, as bullets to use or as like a, yeah, ammo to use. So if you have, let's say a million dollars in the bank as a company and you're burning a hundred thousand dollars a month, you have 10 months ahead of you that represents 10 bullets, if you think of a bullet as a month. It represents 10, 10 cycles. Um, what can you do to make sure that you can do as many iterations on your company as possible before you run out of cash to find you know, a product that works and to find like a evidence that 
there's there's something there and so for me the the number of hours is not necessarily as important as just accelerating that cycle mm-hmm. of iteration and so the way i do this is number of hours but yeah. others might argue you know you can do less fewer hours but be more productive and so mm-hmm. on i'm thinking it's a race against myself yeah so every minute that i don't race i'm uh, using an ammo using a bullet on something that's not meaningful and that's just going to get me further away from my goal yeah um so again i don't know if that's advice i think a lot of people function differently but uh but certainly i think if you have 24 hours in a day so you sleep six at least 18 hours in a day maybe an hour and a half per day for food intake that's you know you're left with 16 and a half hours maybe take a break every now and then leaves you with like 15 and a half to 16 and a half um to 16 hours okay cool you have 16 hours to play with Mm -hmm. i love this idea actually cycles thinking of i mean having a timeline and thinking in terms of the cash flow and the cash burn i think this brings somehow momentum correct me if i'm wrong but it could build momentum right because you you see that time is running so you have to meet meet up with the expectations in order to survive. Yeah, hundred percent. And look, it's funny. We we recently, uh, um, our our BD uh, person, his name is Jacob, um, awesome dude. He we we recently came to uh, came back from a trip to Cyprus. Uh, we had a conference in Cyprus, so it wasn't yeah. the, it wasn't beach and, and towels. Uh, but we came back from the conference in Cyprus, and we had booked a lot of demos after the conference. And uh, we opened up when we came back to San Francisco, Cyprus and San Francisco has 10 hours difference. Right. And we, we opened up our Calendly, so our calendars uh, yeah. at 5 a.m. every day mm-hmm. to make sure that people can book calls at 5 a.m. and 5.30 and 6 and 6.30 and 7 and so on. Um, and we did this to accelerate the cycle. And what we, we did the math on afterwards on how many weeks we saved and uh, we saved five weeks of cycle because we were starting earlier we were able to do 32 demo calls in a week um and the problem with cyprus is because their time difference they can't do calls at at 9 a.m san francisco time so let's say you started like 8 a.m or 8 30 you can do only one or two calls in the Uh day we had uh 32 demos to book so that's 16 days and then there's other calls as well, right? So we did the map and it was like approximately uh, five weeks that we saved um, just by just by doing those calls earlier. Um, so yeah, so I think reducing the number of cycles or ex- ac- accelerating and increasing the number of cycles you can afford to do is, is probably the, the one thing I would focus on early stage. Certainly. And also, you know, you talked about different timelines. So I think even in that case, it holds true even more you being more conscious about the cycles in your experience i mean the, the way you've worked and i know that uh, what has helped you close deals especially when you do not have a proof of concept when you just started because i think that's a blocker for many early stage entrepreneurs are uh, closing deals when they do not really have network effect any proof of concept how do you go about it what did you do uh, well there's a few things i can say the first is that no one is no one has the perfect time. like no one goes selling a product early stage and goes in there with like oh yeah we have the perfect thing it's it's everyone is in the same boat and mm-hmm. so it's just a matter of self-confidence of okay well what are your goals my goal is to sell a product and to make sure that we can build um the best possible company in the world okay cool to do that you need to get clients okay cool to do to get clients you need to pitch and and so it becomes you, you break down a bigger prob a big problem into smaller problems and i think about okay well i'm gonna get a, i'm gonna get punched in that meeting right the, i'm i'm gonna get a no and it's gonna be an ugly no it's not gonna even be a, a polite no and and i had this actually just last week even uh two weeks ago uh the the, the, the worst meeting of my life uh wow. I, I had the most difficult meeting of my life where i actually had to take a few minutes to breathe through at the end to be like, okay, let's just reset the clock here. Um, so I think it's understanding what's the worst that can happen. Mm. And the worst that can happen is you get a no. And the worst that can happen is you get an ugly no. And that's it. And then you realize, okay, well, I'm going to get an ugly no. 
But let me sure let me make sure I get feedback. Let me make sure it's a useful no. And if you flip it that way, then you think, okay, well, whatever happens, I'm gonna I'm gonna come out winning because I'm gonna learn. Maybe I'll close them even better. And if I don't, then I'll learn. So like that's the first thing. The second thing is having luck. Again, I, I think luck is a very important part of it. Yeah. Um, and and knowing how to generate luck or trigger luck or attract luck. Um, a lot of my friends tell me I'm very lucky. It's true. Uh, and and so luck is a component. And three is just asking the right um, the right questions to our prospects. And it's all about understanding. Tell me your pain points. Like walk me through your workflow, and let's see what pain points you have. And I'll tell you if my product solves one of these pain points. So so we're not selling a product. We're selling a solution to a headache that they have. Uh, and so those those three things are the things I I think about constantly. And if you're you know convinced that your product is solving a headache, then I think you should be able to uh, go in there and sell. I think this is a solid advice, especially the first two points that you mentioned. A, you know, not being afraid of losing a deal, and just knowing that you would learn something at the end of the day if you receive a solid feedback, and then asking the right questions. So you receive the feedback and you ask the right questions. So you already have a lot of information to iterate on on your offer. I believe. Yeah, and uh, don't get me wrong. You need to come prepared, right? So. You need mm-hmm. to know your shit. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to know the market. And so the person in front of you needs to understand they're sitting across the table from someone who understands them and who knows what they're talking about. And right. there's a lot of selling made in just a human connection of, do they understand my world? And it basically comes down to if they understand my world and they're telling me this solution works, it's almost like you know 80% of the sale and and so you need to know your numbers you need to know your market you need to know your pain points and your customers so you need to come in prepared but but with that uh, that's that's just the, the first step indeed indeed um alex i know that you are an investor and you've invested in more than 200 companies i believe more than 200 for sure yeah somewhere um, around there i really have a couple of investment related questions i mean for somebody who is seeking investment at an early stage um what kind of investors should should one seek for what is that advice that they should know in order to because you're not going to go after any kind of investor or even incubators and accelerators what could one keep in mind about that for early stage companies so if if their goal is to attract cap first of all i would say especially in this market it's to Try to build your product without raising capital, or at least like to delay. I'm not saying you should not raise ever. That's on a case by case basis, but at least to delay the raising until you really need to. Mm-hmm. And so you're either a repeat founder, and you'll get support from investors because you've you've gone through this before. But if you're a first time founder, it's harder to it's much harder to attract uh, external capital if you haven't proven something. With the evolution of tools out there. It's much easier today and every day that it goes by, it's, it's, it becomes even easier. It's much easier to create a product, even if you don't know how to code, even if you don't have an engineering background and so on. And investors expect founders to roll out their sleeves and to do the work. Right. So there's no more excuse today to not build like an MVP, except in some very rare instances, like if you're in the defense military or something like that. But there's no excuse in... Uh, not having an MVP and not having like three customers. Mm. Uh, and so if someone comes to me and says, Hey, I want you to invest because I want to build a product, an app, a business. I'm like, okay, show me what you've done so far. And they tell me, which happens a lot. Like, Oh no, I, I first want to raise. And with that money, I'll hire engineers and we'll build the product. It's like automatic no go. Yeah. Uh, because you haven't proven that you can hustle and you can figure it out. Um, so, so that's like the very first thing. And then regarding accelerators, most accelerators are not creating any value. Yeah. I had this conversation with Emilia today. Oh, we oh were okay. Just... That's funny. Yeah. But also you, you've spoken about it, you know, uh, I remember that in one of your talks, you said like just some of the people just want to get it, get, get into an incubator or an accelerator just for getting into it. Yeah, like they're playing the startup game, right? So what is the startup game? You raise capital or you go to an incubator, you hire people, like you don't really build product, you're just playing the startup game. And incubators, they give you money, so it's great. So at least you think it's great. 
Um, I would argue most accelerators are probably destructing value, not creating value. It's not just neutral because they actually suck your time. Mm -hmm. And the time as an early stage founder is the most important asset you have. You probably don't have a lot of money. You probably don't have a lot of clients. You probably don't have a lot of employees. All you have is time. And these, these can be a real time suck. So I think that's, that's why I'd say most, not all, but the vast majority of accelerators are uh, just destructive of value. When some of them approach you and they talk about numbers, you know, metrics, um, which kind of metrics or numbers you think are most important because homework is important and uh, sometimes you miss the key, the key numbers that you need to communicate to an investor. So it depends on what stage we're talking about here. Uh, if, if the founder is early stage, pre-seed, mm -hmm. yeah, like pre-seed, they just started, you know, and they have some, some kind of like traction. Um, what you need to show early on, you either have a trajectory where you have a lot of customers and then awesome, then you don't even need an investor. Uh, but most of the times what happens is you have a few customers and you want to make sure that you have like three to 10 customers that are very happy with your product. And it's, it's much better to have 10 customers or even three customers that are very happy with your product right. than having 50 customers that are kind of churning halfway through. Uh, and, and a way to evaluate, you know, happiness of customer, you can think of uh, NPS yeah. as a very simple solution. You can think of retention if you're a paid product, um, but it's it, like anything over 30, 35 NPS out of a hundred. If you think of anything above 30, 35 NPS puts you in a good spot where it's like, okay, you're actually building a product that creates value and you can start trying to get more clients. Uh, so so I, I would look at, yep, NPS above 30 is, is probably where I put the threshold. NPS uh, above 30, okay. Hmm. So when, yeah, okay, I see MVP and then obviously being able to show that the customers, the, the little pool of customers that you have, they're happy with it. Yeah, because so it's not, at this stage, it's not about showing how many clients you have, it's showing you've built a product that made 10 people happy or mm -hmm. 10 businesses happy and Chances are, if those 10 businesses are happy, you'll find more businesses that are just like them. And at least you, you've shown you, you've, you've been able to identify a problem. You've been able to offer a solution that has been accepted by some clients. That's right. already a huge like, step because a lot of companies don't get to that point. I, I totally agree. And on that note, I want, want this one last question um, about your venture, new venture. It's pretty interesting, you know, AI creators for the US space. Um, could you expand more on that? And how did you apply the idea of MVP? Because, you know, in the market out there, people are, there are two kinds of people. Some are hesitant about AI actors and some are very pro because obviously there are a lot of logical reasons behind it. How did you see it and how, what kind of response did you receive in the market so far? Uh, so regarding MVP, we started with um, human actors and, and I think the, the peak pain was when we had, a, we had a studio where actors were coming in and they were recording. So, so we, we were doing short form content to drive user acquisition uh, installs. So installs yes. for mobile apps. And so we had a studio and actors were coming into that studio and we were telling the actor, hey, when you would come in for an hour, record 20 hooks. So 20 like five second videos that says something to start the video off. Record 20 hooks and then record five segments in the middle and then record 20 call to actions in the end like a call to action could be download now it could be go check out in the app store it could be here's the referral code it could be whatever and we edited those manually we have an awesome team who took all this footage took the all the hooks made all the variations so hook one with the base with the call to action one hook two with the base and the call to action one and all of those variations and if you think about the way we use AI, it's at least in, in, in our company pool data AI, it's really about automating a process that has been done very manually. Plus, mm. so, so that's just the, the stitching part, the editing part and so on, plus converting people into digital replicas. So we had the problem. I have, I own a mobile app studio, the mobile app we own, we own 22 apps, the mobile app studio needed content for user acquisition. We were doing this whole situation with actors yeah. coming into studio 
we solve the problem for ourselves. So we build the MVP for ourselves at first. It worked. And then we decided to expand to, hey, if we can do it for ourselves, let's do it for other customers too. And that's where we saw success with other customers and where we decided to focus on pool A as a company. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of how we think about MVP, or at least how I thought about MVP for, for pool A. But it wasn't like it was a prepared plan. It was an organic transition from what we were doing manually to, hey, we can do this in an automated fashion. No, I love that. And especially the fact that you can do A-B testing as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, as a marketer. As, it, as a marketer myself. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, as a marketer myself, uh, I feel like there's a lot of value there because, you know, you decrease, uh, as you say, the, um, the, the operational timeline. Yeah. for you to test different things and um and implement it yeah it, it takes look we we did this the same amount of work or the same amount of output it used to take us about three weeks and now it takes us about an hour um like it took genuinely one hour to create the same content like the same exact number of uh pieces of videos to display on networks on that networks so if you go from three weeks to one hour <laughs> you take a few hours in the day and you have like two months of work done that we used to do in the past at a fraction of the cost, of course. So uh, certainly A-B testing is very, very powerful and video A-B testing is hard. Video when actors are involved is like much harder. And and here we allow marketers to do this in, you know, in, in minutes or hours instead of days or weeks. Very nice. Alex, if you were to build your own dream team, uh, if you were to start again, what kind of people would you like to have in your dream team? I'm asking this question because, you know, as, as an early stage entrepreneur, it's most, mostly you, you're the CTO, you're the CMO, you're everybody yourself. So as entrepreneurs are trying to expand, what shall they look into a person when they're trying to hire? And obviously that depends on the position, but in yeah. general. I, and I think that's the most important it's to, first of all, I'm lucky enough to have a co-founder, so, so I don't have to be the CTO. I would be a very bad CTO, but the, 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 the key there is to solve for like a lot of people think about hiring in terms of like, oh, I assume I'll need like this and that because most companies need this and that really what you want to do is hire to solve the problem that you have at the company level. And so you do this like enough times manually. It's like, oh, I'm really wasting a lot of time doing this inefficient work and I'm not good at it and it could be done better and it's valuable to the company. Let's hire someone to do that. Um, and so for whatever role that is, I would, first, I would encourage people to hire, to solve problems, not hire because you have an investor who told you, you need to hire people. And the second uh, thing I would say is that it, it's really important, especially for the first 10, 20 people, it's really important for everyone to be aligned on what are we trying to do? Are we, you know, we're early stage, let's make sure that people understand and, and, Look, we may not be doing a great job at that. It's just like, I don't know, time will tell. But it's important to align expectations from everyone. It's like, look, if you're early stage, it could take you three years to get product market fit, it could take you five years, it could take you six months, it could take you forever. And so if everyone's aligned with the timeline and people are, are here for the journey, then that's awesome. Then you have the right team. If, if you're not here for... Uh, the journey, then if things go well, then things will go well. But if things tank, then you'll have problems. Uh, so that's where, you know, I think alignment is important. And we have uh, a rule actually uh, that we use a lot when hiring. You know, if there's a doubt, there's no doubt. Meaning if there's ever a doubt in the candidate's ability to perform, then there's no doubt, then it's not the right candidates. And so those are mm -hmm. the couple of things that I try to keep in mind always. And do you ever focus on uh, a candidate's um, personal life? Because people never think about it. But when I say personal life, what is their zeal for life? What do they do other than work? What kind of a personality are they? Um, I not necessarily a lot. So so the reason that we there's been studies around the fact that you, you, you potentially introduce bias by looking into their personal lives. Um, let's say that, you know, I, I love kite surfing. And if I realize that a person also love kite surfing, it instantly, whether I want it or not, it builds a bond mm -hmm. and it builds a lookalike. 
um, you know, model. I'm like, yeah, oh, we're, we're, like we're, 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 we're similar. And, and people want to hire a copy of themselves usually. Like it, it, it's very easy to fall in this where you just want to, you, you think you're great. You think you're the greatest. And so it's like, oh, this person is like me. I'm the greatest. So of course they will be the greatest. And so that's, that's like, that's one way to, to, to go about it. Uh, so if there's ever questions about their personal life, I usually like to keep it around um, as evidence of something they said. So if, if they said, you know, that they're very disciplined, show me that you're disciplined. Like how are, show me why, what you think you can say you're disciplined. And mm-hmm. maybe they'll say, oh, discipline's good. I go to the gym every day at 5 a.m. Cool. This is the, for the last 12 years I've done this. Okay, you're disciplined. So this is an aspect of personal life. But I'm less interested in what they're doing on their personal life and more so using that as evidence of something they say to back their claim for whatever it is that they're, you know, or, or like I'm highly competitive and I like to win. Okay, what did you do? Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's how I yeah, think about it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, a lot of candidates would say things, but it would be nice to just probe further and ask, you know, what makes you think that you, that you are X, Y, and Z? Um, and yeah, I do agree that there might be some fallacy of association. If you like X and the other person like X, you like the other person. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Alex, this was great. Um, Thanks a lot for your time. I know that there is a lot to extract from you. So maybe some other time we can have a dedicated session just on investment. But thanks a lot. Anytime. Happy to do it. Thank you so much for inviting and for uh, setting it up. Loved it. Yes. Bye-bye.